Greetings, everyone. Laszlo Montgomery here with another China History Podcast episode, and a special one at that. Rather than your humble narrator prattling on about this topic, requested so many times over the years, I've invited on to this long-running family program one of my friends from the area to help us introduce the topic of the history of Hainan province. And I'm most delighted to welcome onto the CHP Dr. Jeremy Murray, Associate Professor at Cal State University, San Bernardino. Dr. Murray teaches modern Chinese history at this esteemed institution of higher learning, founded in 1965. He is the author of China's Lonely Revolution, the local communist movement of Hainan Island, 1926 to 1956. That came out on SUNY Press, among other books and articles. I've invited Jeremy on to discuss a subject he's duly qualified to speak about, the history of China's smallest and newest province. Well, not that new. It's been 33 years. So let me give a warm CHP welcome to Dr. Jeremy Murray. Welcome to the CHP. Great to have you on again. Thank you very much, Laszlo. It's a pleasure to join you today. This is actually not your first appearance on the CHP. We had you on in September... 2019 to discuss the book you co-edited with Perry Link and Paul Pickowitz, China Tripping, Encountering the Everyday in the People's Republic. I had the honor to host that discussion, and thanks to you, I got to rub elbows with those two grizzled veterans in the field of Chinese history, a small fry like me, mixing with these giants in their respective fields. That was a great time. Where did we record that one? That was at UC San Diego. At UC San Diego, I felt the same, like a small fry next to those guys. It was really a pleasure to work with both of them, but also to be on your podcast. And I want to also say that China Tripping has just been released as an audiobook, and that's thanks to that podcast, thanks to the inspiration that you provided by getting us in the, in the studio in the first place to talk about the book. It, it was, I think, some of your listeners who had reached out to me after they heard that podcast, asking whether there was going to be a full audiobook version. And I think that the book in those short vignettes and the way we did it with multiple narrators really lent itself nicely to the, to the medium, to the audio medium. So uh, thanks to you, that's where, that's where we started with the idea to actually get that audiobook off the ground. And that interview with you, Perry, and Paul was released as a two-part special episode and I'll have links to parts one and two at the show notes for this episode for anyone who'd like to listen to that one. And one of the things you and I discussed was collaborating together on the history of Hainan because of that research you had done on the subject. And each time we got together, we'd talk about doing it. And now here we are two years later and finally getting around to it. And also... Thanks for having me on with the Moors recently, Lee and Rob of the Chinese Literature Podcast. Is that program you moderated at CSUSB ever going up on YouTube or anything? Yeah, that's that's up on YouTube now, and I can share the link with you. That's the uh, CSUSB Modern China Lecture Series, and folks can find that YouTube page. We also have a, uh, a CSUSB hosted page, and I can share that link with you there. That was an excellent discussion. And really nice to to host to both of these two juggernaut podcasts, the, the Chinese yeah. literature podcast, the Chinese history podcast, really such wonderful materials that you both are putting out there to a listening audience that, that otherwise might not have the time to sit down with, with some of these texts. So it's a really wonderful podcast that you and, and Rob and Lee Moore have over at the Chinese Literature Podcast. So it was really cool. It was great to share that with my crew at CSUSB. And I also want to note that your podcast gets me through many a, a drive into work, many a commute into work, especially when the <laughs> When the uh, news is a little bit too gloomy to keep me company, I, I love listening to your podcast as well. Yeah, well, there's plenty of gloomy CHP episodes in the back catalog, but not this one. This one shows all kinds of promise. So let's get right down to the mission here. Hainan, what a lovely place. I've only been to Sanya. I wouldn't mind retiring there. So what's your Hainan story? I'm sure you have more to your story than the six days I spent frolicking on the beach at Haitang Bay. I also went there uh, first as a tourist, just like you. And like many people, that was my first encounter with Hainan. I was studying in Beijing for my junior year at SUNY Albany in 99-2000. And I had a friend at a neighboring university who invited me and another classmate down to his hometown for the Spring Festival. 
uh, the Chunjia holiday in the winter of uh, early 2000. And so for the longer holiday, January, February, the Chunjia holiday, we headed south and visited my friend's hometown, also in, in Sanya. And I was really struck by the place, not just because of, you know, the beautiful beaches, of course, and the laid back lifestyle, but because it really felt like a place apart. The tourism uh, just taking off there, uh, not just domestic tourism, but international tourism. There were plenty of mainlanders and uh, plenty of Russians around the Sanya area, not as much around Haiko, the provincial capital in the north, but especially in the south around the beaches. But this was still before the establishment of the Boao Forum, the famous international economic forum now that's, that's uh, quite an important annual meeting. Uh, it was before the most elite of the luxury resorts were being constructed, before the duty-free incentives that uh, lure the wealthy mainlanders there, uh, which I'm sure we'll talk about a little bit later. And I was just really impressed with, particularly with the humor, with the wit, and really with the irreverence of some of the people that I met in Hainan. I felt like that sort of guest host interaction that a lot of foreigners feel or felt in, in that time and in earlier years that, that we got at in the China Tripping book uh, felt a lot less formal, less scripted, more relaxed. Reminded me of that expression, Tian Gao Huang Di Yuan, heaven is high <laughs> and the emperor is far away. And uh, it can mean a few things that can have sort of positive and negative implications. But the idea that the, some of the rules won't be enforced quite as strictly out here, way out here at the margins. And, um, and maybe there's a little bit of a kind of a wild frontier mentality as well. But I did feel that the culture of Hainan, which I think we're also going to talk about, uh, sometimes felt like a real realm apart, a real uh, place apart. And from then on, seeing China from Hainan was a new thing. It was a kind of revelation that I had there of the diversity and the complexity of China and especially of the region. And then jumping ahead a few years later in, in 2004, I was in my second year of my doctoral studies at UCSD. And I decided I wanted to understand the event of the takeover of Hainan. We were prompted in a, in a doctoral seminar there with Joseph Escherich and Paul Pickowitz to, to choose an event in Chinese history to, to understand. And I chose the communist takeover of Hainan in the spring of 1950. It was sort of in between the establishment of the People's Republic of China in October of 1949, on the one hand. And then on the other hand, it's also on the eve of the Korean War, which is going to sort of reshuffle the deck in terms of what people were expecting at that time in China, in all of East Asia, actually. And I wanted to understand what was behind that campaign, what its importance was incorporating half of nationalist territory into the People's Republic of China at that time. Hainan is about the same size as, as Taiwan. And then that project would go on to snowball into China's Lonely Revolution, and that focused on the, especially on the local communist forces there on Hainan. Well, we'll get to all that PRC history later on. So let's start at the beginning of Hainan history. What do we know about the geological formation? Was it always an island? No. If we go back, this is tens of millions of years in, in sort of geological time. If we go back far enough, we see that the landmass that is today Hainan Island was actually connected to the mainland, but more off of its what is today the island's western coast. And that is what's, what's today called Vietnam. And of course, this is tens of millions of years before any of those land masses had our geopolitical designs on them. But according to a recent study, it was volcanic eruptions that led to the island's separation from the mainland. And while, of course, these regions didn't necessarily have our geostrategic ideas, you know, the volcanoes didn't have any ideas about, about what was China and what was Vietnam, there is some interest in sort of saying who, who gets to claim what, even in these earliest <laughs> days. So the, this, this revelation was significant. And there are, there are some resources that I can, I can share with you, and you might be interested in sharing with your listeners about some recent discoveries that have confirmed that Hainan separated off from Vietnam, which is, which is to its west. Yeah, I vaguely recall reading about that in some SCMP article that Hainan was, you know, tens of millions of years ago connected to the northern Vietnam coast, which, well, might explain why some plants and animals native to Vietnam could also be found in Hainan. How did Hainan get its name? And why is the character Chung used as the official abbreviation that you see everywhere, you know, including on the license plates? And, you know, what are some of the other names historically that Hainan was known by? There are a few names, like most, most provinces. 
in most regions of China. There are a few names that Hainan has had through the years. The Qiong character simply means uh, fine jade. At least that's the sort of textbook definition that you get when you look it up in most Chinese dictionaries. A few of the other Chinese names that Hainan has been given throughout the years are Zhuya, Qiongya, Qiongzhou. And again, Qiong meaning fine jade, Zhu meaning pearl, Ya means uh, cliff in this case. So, so uh, this sort of idea of cliffs is, of course, the coastline that mainland sailors might have encountered. But also there's this Tianya Haijiao idea of sort of the ends of the earth. A journeying to the end of the earth is an idea that before people were thinking of, of the earth as a globe, you had this idea that the earth might have some kind of cliff as well. And so there's also this, this possible idea that, that uh, people were thinking of cliffs in the sense of you know, falling off the edge of the, of the earth. And then Chung becomes this fine jade term. Uh, Chung becomes the single character abbreviation for Hainan. And that's what you see on the license plates. Today, Hainan is the name that we see most. Uh, and it simply means South Nan of the sea, Hai. Uh, because Hainan is south of the sea uh, in its relation to the mainland. During the Shang and Zhou, was anything cooking down in Hainan, or even during the Qin? It doesn't look like the Qin got any emissaries to Hainan, at least that I'm aware of, any kind of official military political mission there. There seems to have been an, an awareness of the island, but not any kind of official mission. And in such a brief dynasty that had such a, a tenuous hold on southern China, you see that its political military focus is mainly in the northern and the, the central power bases out of which the Qin emerges. The state of Qin becomes the Qin Empire. The Bronze Age dynasties, likewise, are uh, the Xiaoshang and Zhou, are mainly based in the north, especially around the Yellow River Valley, of course. And so there's this northern focus of very early Chinese history and, and even proto-history going back to the, to the Xia and early mythology where the priority really is, is up in that northern Yellow River Valley. And so no, no time for the deep south Hainan Island there. How about during the Han Dynasty, Western and Eastern? I believe during the time of Han Wu Di, there was some action going on. And also, if you could mention, regarding the local language down in Hainan, that wasn't anything from the Sino-Tibetan branch. Am I correct there? The, the earliest people that we know of are today referred to as the Li. Uh, and there are a number of names that this group is given, and it's actually quite a diverse group. The Li people are also known as the Hlai or the Sai. Again, a number of different names throughout the years, as Hainan is. Today, they make up about 15% of the Hainan island population. And, so, and the remainder, 85%, being mostly Han Chinese, and it's important to note this is a larger percentage than most regions in mainland China of, uh, of, of a minority population. Most, uh, again, most regions, not all. Other uh, significant groups in the island's history that are going to come in a little bit later are the Miao, also known as the Hmong, uh, also the Zhuang. And again, later, you're going to have a group known as the Utsat or Utsul uh, Muslim populations. And they're considered today to be part of the Hui Muslim population, although they are uh, also a group unto themselves. Those designations, those ethnic designations, most of them come around in the 1950s. Lee made it to the top 20. Yeah, absolutely. And, and uh, Barely. We'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit because that does have to do with the political circumstances that, that have to do with the Lee working together with the communist forces to bring the island into the People's Republic of China. Can you talk more about the Lee? What more can you say about them? The Lee are a diverse group. They make up today about 15% of the island's population. Obviously, they were much higher percentage of the population throughout Chinese history into the Qing dynasty. They're a distinct group, but they also have diversity within the group themselves. And, and I think that's an important thing to note. There are different groups that have different practices. One of the most common things that people remark about the Li is the tattooing of the face of Li women. And this is something that you see in other, some other parts of the world. A lot of the accounts that I've come across about this particular practice is that it's mainly about recognition of people in the afterlife, that you recognize them by their, by their facial tattoos. So this is something that really you can still see among some very few Lee women is that the facial tattoos, the very distinct line patterns often in the facial tattoos. 
Another really important aspect of Lee culture that stands out very much is the weaving. And this is something that you see going on still in Chinese ethnotourism. Two Lee regions, and they have now today Li Miao autonomous regions within or autonomous districts within Hainan Island. In terms of their relationship with the Han, obviously, this is going to be contentious from the beginning. The Han Chinese mainlanders coming to Hainan Island are going to be forced to settle around the coast. At first, they have regular interactions, sometimes in the form of trade, sometimes in the form of, of oppressive, what they would call you know, pacification campaigns of the lead to try to deal with any kind of conflict that's often met with overwhelming force. But at the same time, the Lee are able to hold the island's interior really for centuries in the face of attempts by mainland Chinese to completely, again, in quotes, sort of pacify the island. So that's a big dynamic there that's going to continue. The Li, like many other ethnic groups, are divided by the Han, the mainlanders who arrive from China throughout these several centuries into the Shu and Sheng, which are sort of roughly called the cooked or the raw. It's a sort of a... Like the like, uh, Puar tea. Right, right, exactly. And, and you have sort of the more mellowed, in the view of the Han Chinese, the more mellowed version that is the Li who are willing to take on Han Chinese customs in terms of clothing, in terms of uh, trading with the Han, in terms of perhaps not being in a state of uprising or of you know rejecting the Han's presence on the island. And then you also have Li who are living in the island's interior and have much less contact with the Han. And they are, for the most part, practicing hunting and slash and burn agriculture. But you see a, a, a mainland Chinese desire to develop Hainan into a kind of agricultural breadbasket for the Chinese mainland. And that never really delivers, even until the, the most recent years. How about like ethnically, linguistically, the, the language, it wasn't a Sino-Tibetan language at all. That's right. It comes from the Kadai or the Kradai language family. And so you see a very distinctive language spoken by the Li that wasn't written down for centuries. And it comes from, yeah, it comes from this Kradai or Kadai language family that includes portions of mainland China. It predates, you know, any kind of geopolitical divisions between northern Vietnam and uh, southern and southwestern China. But those are really the areas that it's going to come from. But indeed, yeah, it's not from the Sino-Tibetan language group that Chinese comes from. So let's look more at the Han. That's really where the first major nexus occurs between China and what was developing down in Hainan. What circumstances brought the Chinese down there? So this is, by most accounts, we've got the famous General Lu Boide and these Han Dynasty expansions into southern China. Again, like these earlier Xiaoshangzhou dynasties, the expansions into the south are relatively tenuous compared to what's going to happen in the Tang, where we have the much more thoroughgoing incorporation of southern China. And of course, that's going to come after the Three Kingdoms period and the so-called period of disunity that, that follows the Han. But going back to the second century, the second, third century BCE, we see the beginnings of the incorporation of southern China in a, in a uh, more thorough way than what happened in the Qin. The, the number that you see out there a lot is just before 100 BC, when, when Hainan is established as a frontier garrison in the Han dynasty. And this is largely focused around the coast of the island. The Li people that we mentioned earlier are going to be obviously resistant to this, what's seen as a, as a kind of mainland invasion of Hainan, or mainland settlement, a garrisoning of the coast of the island. And you see some garrisons set up along the island's coast in the what's called the former Han the earlier portion of that sort of four century stretch of the Han dynasty. So that we do see, this is, this is the earliest period when we really see definite evidence of some Han authority, some Han dynasty, mainland Chinese presence on Hainan Island. When did Hainan start to be taken more seriously? When did it finally get fully integrated with what was developing uh, on the mainland? That's going to really start happening in Tang Dynasty and then especially in the Song Dynasty. 
where, again, southern China is incorporated into what we think of as these this sort of parade of Chinese dynasties. Southern China is going to be incorporated in a way that it hadn't been in the Xia, Shang, Zhou, Qin, and Han after that uh, period of disunity that includes the Three Kingdoms period. And we can thank the brief Sui dynasty for that in, in some ways, and the, and the building of the Grand Canal and the connection really of northern and southern China. And this, I think, is in large part where we can see the connection of the incorporation of southern China into these dynasties that continue to be mainly based in central or northern China politically. But it's in the Tang and Song that we start to see Hainan emerging as increasingly and more thoroughly incorporated into later dynasties. I know Hainan, like Xinjiang, like Sichuan, was one of the noted places of banishment. It was considered so distant and so uncivilized, and it became a place to punish officials for all manners of you know, political mistakes or miscalculations, usually against the emperor. There were, there were quite a few examples of that. This starts as early as the Tang Dynasty, as the the seventh and eighth centuries, especially in the in the late eighth century, when Hainan becomes useful, as you say, as a place of banishment. And there are several very very notable, uh, really prominent Chinese officials who are sent to Hainan for various offenses against emperors, whether it is the Confucian tradition of loyal remonstrance, that is making a, a criticism of the emperor based on what the, the minister considers to be patriotism, that is, you know, pointing out the, the problems of uh, various policy or maybe personal habits of the emperor in a, in a quite public way. We see these kind of officials, especially targeted for exile, get them out of the way. The emperor would send them away, as you say, a, a kind of punishment that is just short of death. It does leave the opportunity for return. And in many of these cases, you do see return. You do see officials returning from exile. But an interesting thing happens in Hainan in that many of these banished officials, these officials who are banished to the, the, you know, the ends of the earth, as it's called, you know, Tianya Haijiao, the the sort of ends of the earth, is that they become adopted as, as sort of marginalized heroes who become adopted as the native sons of Hainan. They're kind of the adopted sons of Hainan. And they become celebrated, especially uh, several emperors through the late Tang and into the Song dynasty. This is especially the the Wugong or the the, the five ministers. And in Haikou today, you have the Wugong Tzu, uh, which is the temple of the five lords or the five ministers. Did you spend any time visiting the temple of the five lords? I did. I did. And it's, it's a, um, when, when I was there uh, last, actually, it's about uh, 12 years ago, 13 years ago, um, it was a pretty, pretty sleepy place. I imagine now these days with tourism booming, I, it's more uh, lively. So who were these unfortunate five ministers who committed such egregious acts that saw them banished to this, well, now vacation paradise? What did they do? So the, the list is, Li Deyu, Li Gang, Li Guang, Zhao Ding, and Hu Quan. And they range from, from the 8th century, from the late 8th century to the 12th century. And these are five figures who are, uh, who are exiled to Hainan, and they each have distinctive stories. Let's start with Li Deyu. I believe he served both Wen Zong and Wu Zong during the Tang. Li Deyu is, is probably the most prominent of the five figures featured in the Five Ministers Temple, the five, the Temple of the Five Lords. He's a Tang Dynasty official, born in uh, 787. He's a very, very prominent Chinese official in the Tang Dynasty. He's involved in factional struggles. That's the main thing that's going to bring him down. It's also going to bring down a number of the other officials as well as what we were calling the, the sixth beetle, the one who's not included that we'll talk about in a little bit, Sudong Po. The factional struggles often would change with the change of an emperor, where one emperor would favor one faction, and then another emperor would come into power, and he would switch his allegiance. And in the case of Li Deyu, it's something called the Niu Li factional struggle. 
it's going to have to do with a number of policies that go pretty deep into Tang politics. And although I'm not an expert on this, there is a certain pattern that emerges in terms of banishing these factional leaders. And of course, that's the reward for Li Deyu, who is going to, unlike some of the others in this group, is going to die in Hainan. And uh, some of them are able to make it out alive and some of them do not. And so, again, the closeness to a death sentence that this kind of banishment was is was obviously very, very real for, for Li Deyu. How about Li Guang, Li Gang? Li Gang, we know not quite as much about. He is a Song dynasty official. Again, a period in which there's an enormous amount of factional struggle. And this is, of course, very different factional struggle, different from, from what's going on in the Tang. But these very high-ranking officials often put their lives on the line in the case of presenting their position to the emperor and sometimes that's in favor and sometimes it's not. And in the case of Li Gang, this has to do with conflict related to fallout from wars between the Song and their northern neighbors. Li Guang, we know not quite as much about, but again, both of these guys are 11th into the 12th centuries. And Zhao Ding, things get a little bit more interesting. We know a little bit more about Zhao Ding, who also dies in Hainan. He is honored in the deep south of Hainan in Sanya, which is a little bit different from the others who mainly were around Haiko. Uh, Zhao Ding dies, uh, according to most accounts, he, he dies as a result of a, a hunger strike that he takes to its ultimate end. And then finally, Hu Quan is, is another figure banished to Hainan. And he is able to live through his banishment again as the as the sort of wheels of time turn and the and uh, new emperors come to power, new new factions come to power within the court. You see a lot of these guys live out the term of their banishment and actually make it back to the mainland. Okay, so those were the five lords. How about the biggest one of all? The one we remember the most, a perennial favorite here at the China History Podcast, Su Shi or Su Dong Po. Yeah, Su Shi and 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 here I'm going to draw on the work of my undergrad advisor, Jim Hargett, who I worked with at SUNY Albany. Uh, and he's just an absolutely terrific scholar of Chinese literature. He has a wonderful piece called Clearing the Apertures and Getting in Tune, the Hainan Exile of Su Shi. And uh, Su Shi is another figure who goes, uh, gets us uh, from 1037 to 1101. Su Shi is, is distinct from the others. And this is also something that Edward Schaefer noted in his book, Shore of Pearls, which I'd recommend uh, to anybody who wants a really lively account of early Hainan history. Su is, uh, or, or, or Su Dong Po, as he's sometimes referred to, is banished to Hainan for uh, about three years. And also his banishment is going to be rescinded. He's going to be invited back so that he can be reunited with his entire family. He brings some members of his family when he goes. But just toward the very end of his life, he's, he's going to be invited back. And I think it's worth noting that Sushir is distinct from the others in that he really is quite, I, I don't want to say he's cheerful in his exile. He has a really positive tone in a lot of the poetry that he's writing. And we have his writings and we have his poetry from this time, obviously, as such a prolific figure from this era. We have a lot of the writings that he produces, and at a certain point, he says, Wabun Hainan Min, I am a native of Hainan. So many of the Hainanese who are eager to adopt these, these banished ministers as their own adoptive sons, he makes his way there with great trepidation and anxiety. He's not extremely healthy when he goes down there, and so he sees it, as we, we've discussed, he sees it as really tantamount to a death sentence. And then something changes. Things don't get better for him after he arrives. He has some companions there, uh, family members, a son. He leaves his brother on the mainland and the rest of his family. But he has some companions there. Some of them are willing to welcome him, uh, make him feel as comfortable as possible. An official there, a military official named Zhang Zhong, who allows him to live in the military compound until it becomes found out that he did that. So Su Shi is allowed to live in the government compound. And then word gets out that this disgraced official is still living in the official compound because he's made friends with one of the local officials. And he's promptly exiled. He's promptly booted from, from that. So he's, he's banished from his banishment. 
and he's forced <laughs> to build what by most accounts are a little cottage, you know, somewhere close by. And he has plenty of help from admiring friends and students who help him bring the, build this very humble little cottage. And this is in, in what is today Dancho in, in the uh, northern Hainan. So this is his condition. He's been evicted. And after this time, he seems to, in some ways, resign himself to kind of grin and bear it a little bit. But I think something even, even more than that, something even more kind of positive in terms of how he's writing it, about it. And he makes friends with a family named Lee, the same character. They most likely are of Lee ancestry. And there's a wonderful passage from, from a poem that uh, Jim Hargit quotes here of Su Dongpo making his way home from a night out with the Lee family through the wilds, basically. He's walking home probably by moonlight. He writes, half sober, half tipsy, I go to pay a call on the leaves. Bamboo thorns, creepers, wisteria, I'm more lost with each step. I can only follow the cow patties and trace my path home. My home is west, further west of the cow pen. I think there, there, there seems to be a kind of affection there for his, for his wild new home and the people that he encounters there. In this piece, Jim Hargit goes on to talk about the importance of Taoism and Buddhism in his worldview, as well, obviously, of the importance of Confucianism and a sense of public service. So Su Dongpo really is an important kind of an exception that proves the rule of how brutal and how grinding this could be, this kind of exile could be, because he certainly makes the most of it, makes a study of the island, continues to write this um, classic eternal poetry, a really beautiful verse. And then there is a change in emperor. And after all of this, he is invited back. And unfortunately, it is on his way back that he does succumb to illness, that he dies on his way home. But a, a fascinating figure within the history of Hainan, I think. Besides the great Su Shi, what can you tell us about Hai Rei? He had an association with Hainan, didn't he? In modern times, we... Recall Hai Rei from the Wuhan play, Hai Rei Ba Guan, that was uh, Hai Rei dismissed from office, which was one of the most important early stepping stones to the Cultural Revolution. Well, he's the seventh of the major ministers from pre-modern China. Um, and I'm really stretching here, by the way. He's from Hainan, which, of course, is going to set him apart from the others. He's from Hainan. He's from the Chongshan region, also northern part of Hainan. He has a massive temple complex there now or uh, a, a tomb there that you can visit. And he leaves Hainan. He becomes a very prominent official. This is now uh, about 500 years later, 400 years later. Now we're talking about uh, 1514 to 1587. He's going to leave Hainan. However, similar to the other six figures we've just talked about, he is also going to get in trouble with imperial factionalism and issues of policy implementation. That is also going to get him into trouble. As you say, he famously launches a critique of the emperor, of the Ming emperor, yeah, that was the uh, thin-skinned uh, Ming Emperor Jia Jing. He didn't appreciate high race, sincerity, and honesty. He famously made his funeral arrangements before he launched this critique. I remember hearing as a student a, a rather dramatic account of how he actually dragged his coffin into the audience with the emperor, saying, I'm going to have my say and you're going to put me in here when I'm done. That's the sort of caricature of the loyal remonstrance. I don't think it happened in exactly that way, but the fact that he very publicly made his funeral arrangements was a kind of way for him to impugn the system of justice around him because he said, I'm going to go and, and say what a good Confucian official should say, and then chances are I'm going to be killed for it. Uh, he's ultimately not executed for it, but it becomes this very famous episode in Chinese history. And again, just to, yeah, just to touch on that note that you mentioned, Hai Rei dismissed from office, this play that is written in, I think, the early 1960s by Wuhan then becomes, and sort of on the eve of the Cultural Revolution, we see this play being written as a kind of implicit criticism of the excesses of Maoist policy. And so Hai Rei is intended to be a kind of stand-in for, for Peng De Huai, for Marshall Peng, who makes a rather mild criticism, I think, of Mao Zedong. Yeah, Peng De Huai, Mao's homie from his Guxiang. Unlike Hai Rei, 
he sent Mao a very private criticism in the form of a letter that he didn't share with anyone. But Mao brought that letter to the meeting being held at Lushan, and as a result, Peng ended up getting plowed under, which opened the door for a more Mao-friendly defense minister, namely Lin Biao. Yeah, and so and so that's that's compared to the much more flamboyant criticism of Hai Rei. And so this the writing and the and the publishing of this play is enough to cause a lot of anxiety. So that that becomes a the sort of touchstone of Hai Rei throughout throughout Chinese history. We skipped over the Yuan. That was a consequential time for Hainan, wasn't it? The borders, the name of the island. The cement starts to dry right about here. In spite of, of the distance and in spite of it being across the sea, the Mongol Yuan are going to complete their conquest of Hainan as they complete the conquest of the Southern Song in the 1270s. And it is in this period, sort of anecdotally, it's in this period that Hainan becomes more commonly referred to as Hainan. That becomes the more common name for the island and sometimes the surrounding islands, so south of the seas, and then Lejo Peninsula and the immediate surrounding areas of Guang, what are, what are today regions of Guangdong province. There is another minor, again, somewhat anecdotal note here about the connection of Hainan to the Mongol rule, and that is that in its conquest of Dai Viet, what is today Vietnam, or, or rather not its conquest, but it, in its uh, invasions of that region, the, the Mongols actually bring in fighters from Hainan, forces from Hainan, especially actually ethnic Li fighters who joined the Mongol invasions of Dai Viet. This came after the conquest of Hainan and incorporated some Li fighters in the, in the Mongol fighting forces. Let's close off part one here with the Jesuits. The Portuguese Jesuit, Balthasar Gago, after a stretch of missionary work in Japan, on his return voyage to Portugal, he gets shipwrecked on Hainan and stayed there a couple of months before being rescued and making his way to Macau. So into the late 1500s, Catholic missionaries dabbled in proselytizing in Hainan, but I don't think they had much success, or at least success on the scale that they had hoped for. In this period, we see an increasing number of Jesuit Catholics, especially, making their way over. Some of them arrive on the shores of Hainan, really just a handful, mainly in the century from about 1550 to about 1650. Some of them end up on Hainan on purpose. Some end up on Hainan because they shipwrecked nearby. Some of these figures actually thrive there, and we have some evidence of that because we see that they have tombstones that respect their Catholic burial practices. And some of those tombstones are still there in the area around Taiko. They did have some who converted, uh, apparently, but it was a, a relatively small group in that, in that period. But foreigners begin to gain some knowledge, some understanding of Hainan that way. And then something very different happens, of course, with the arrival of Protestants, and that's especially going to take off in the 19th century and especially in the wake of the Opium Wars. And of course, Hainan is very close to some of the major flashpoints of the Opium Wars, including uh, Guangzhou, including uh, Canton, and Hong Kong. Okay, rather than start talking about the Qing Dynasty and what was happening down in Hainan, let's draw the curtain right here, and we'll finish things off in part two. We'll look at Hainan during the Qing, the Republican era, as well as during PRC history, and whatever else comes to mind. This is Laszlo Montgomery. I'm here with Dr. Jeremy Murray. We're talking about Hainan, and I would like to extend this formal invitation to all of you to come back again next time for another satisfying episode of the China History Podcast.